So we've established so far that there are just two roots for all world religions and belief systems. The first root comes from Nimrod, Babylon and behind it is Satan. The second root comes from Israel, the worship of the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. These are the two competing kingdoms in this world, the kingdom of darkness and the kingdom of light. Now some people, particularly Muslims themselves, would have you believe that Islam belongs to the second route, that it shares its origins with Judeo-Christianity and is something of a continuation of those faiths, that Islam is the last and true revelation of the Judeo-Christian God to his people. Even some Christians have been deceived into thinking that the word Allah is just an Arabic word for the Christian God, Yahweh, and that we are connected somehow. While we can't go through every religion one by one to show the links to Babylon, it's worth taking a little time to study Islam because of its prevalence on the world stage right now. So what I intend to do in this part is briefly show that Islam finds its roots in Babylon. The beginnings of Islam go back to Muhammad, who was born in 570 AD in Mecca, and who is revered in Islam as the last great prophet of God, usurping the authority and preeminence of Moses, Elijah, and even Jesus himself. Because religions tend to assume the character of their founding figure, this is the best place to start in understanding Islam. The Muslims have one holy book called the Quran, and several other volumes called Hadith, which are oral traditions relating to the words and deeds of Muhammad. Hadiths are considered important tools for determining the Muslim way of life. Sahih al-Bukhari and Sahih Muslim are thought to be particularly authoritative. According to the Hadith of Bukhari, Muhammad used to retire to a cave alone where he would spend long periods of time, several days, praying to Allah. It was in the cave that he experienced an encounter with an angel who apparently gave him a revelation from God. The angel asked him to read some writing, whereupon he replied that he couldn't read. Muhammad was illiterate. The angel then pressed upon him with such force and in such a way that he felt like he was going to die. Clearly it was a distressing experience. Upon returning to his wife Kadiha, he is reported to have been terrified, indeed his neck muscles twitching with terror, and convinced that he had encountered something satanic. Now his wife Kadiha had a Roman Catholic cousin called Waraka. Kadiha ran to Waraka to report this experience to him to see if he had any insight from his Catholic religion. In response, Waraka wrongly referenced Moses as receiving revelations from the angel Gabriel in this manner and suggested this could have been what had happened to Muhammad. The angel Gabriel is in fact only mentioned in the Bible four times, twice in Daniel and twice in Luke, and never in relation to Moses. After hearing about this, however, Muhammad's mind was changed about who he had just had an encounter with. He began to think of himself as a prophet who had been visited by an angel of God. As a result of this experience, however, Muhammad became suicidal and attempted to kill himself on multiple occasions. He had two main periods of suicidal thinking where he began attempting to throw himself from mountains in a bid to find relief from mental torture. I said to myself, your humble servant is either a poet or a madman, but Quraysh shall never say this of me. I shall take myself to a mountain crag, hurl myself down from it, kill myself and find relief in that way. The second period of suicidal thoughts came when these visitations ceased. The inspiration ceased to come to the messenger of God for a while and he was deeply grieved. He began to go to the tops of mountain crags in order to fling himself from them. From these passages that show Muhammad's suicidal mental state, it seems clear he was visited not by an angel but by a demon or possibly Satan himself, as Muhammad himself had first suspected. Now visitations from angels who give people a different message were foreseen by the Apostle Paul in his letter to the Galatians. There we read, But even if we, or an angel from heaven, should preach a gospel other than the one we preach to you, let them be under God's curse. As we have already said, so now I say again, if anybody is preaching to you a gospel other than what you accepted, let them be under God's curse. The cave experience was not the first time Muhammad had been in contact with something demonic. He apparently had a strange but undefined experience as a child, after which his carer became convinced he had been possessed by a demon. Further evidence for potential demonic possession comes even within the Quran. 
in Surah 81.22-25 and Surah 69.41-42, people claim that Muhammad was inspired by the devil and something of a madman. Further evidence of Muhammad's mental disturbance is to be found in the Hadith of Bukhari, Volume 7 and Number 660. For a whole year, he was so bewitched and befuddled that he thought he was having sexual relations with his wives when he wasn't. This is a strange scenario which can realistically only have two explanations. Either mental illness caused him to hallucinate, or he had some kind of sexual encounters with demonic entities. Either way, Muhammad was clearly disturbed. At one point in time, Muhammad admitted that Satan had put words in his mouth to compromise with pagan idol worship. These words have become known as the Satanic Verses. He later changed his mind on the issue, but it shows that he was unable to distinguish the source of his revelation. Another politically incorrect but equally true assertion is that he was a paedophile, marrying his wife Aisha when she was six years old and consummating the relationship when she was only nine. Muhammad was over 50 years old at the time. All kinds of arguments have been put forward in an attempt to excuse this behaviour. Muhammad in fact had over 20 wives in his lifetime, while hypocritically restricting his own followers to just four. One of his followers says, I embraced Islam while I had eight wives, so I mentioned it to the Prophet. The Prophet said, select four of them. Muhammad himself was so filled with insatiable lusts and sexual desire that he would have relations with all of his wives in one night. Anas bin Malik said, the Prophet used to visit all his wives in a round during the day and night, and there were eleven in number. I asked Anas, had the Prophet the strength for it? Anas replied, we used to say that the Prophet was given the strength of thirty men. And now we can understand a little why Muslims are promised constant fornication with virgins in their paradise. It reflects the character of their Prophet. In this we also see similarities with the prominence of sexuality in occultism. Finally, as we look for links to Babylon, it should also be noted that Muhammad's visitations came in caves. As we noted way back at the start of the study, Babylonian worship, particularly relating to Nebo, happened in caves and was common practice in the mysteries.